Hey guys, it's Gretchen and welcome back to my channel. It is time for my next Pearson comprehensive guide. This one is going to be entirely about the Rook Pearson. As always, my patrons are the ones who vote on which Pearson I focus on for the next comprehensive guide. So if you would like to get in on being able to vote for what the next Pearson comprehensive guide will be about, I do have a Patreon. It is in my description below if you're interested and you get voting privileges on polls that are posted as well as other exclusive content that no one else gets. So if you have never seen any of my Pearson Comprehensive Guides before, here is just a little bit of a rundown of how these go. In these Pearson Comprehensive Guides, I focus on five specific areas. What is the Pearson? The procedure and pain, relatively speaking, for the Pearson. What to expect with healing and aftercare. Jewelry sizing, typically, as well as jewelry options typically. So as I mentioned, this guide is going to be focusing on the Rook Pearson. So what is the Rook Pearson? The Rook Pearson is located in the upper half of your ear. It is located above the tragus and the daith, duff, and kind of in line with where a forward helix would be. So I'll insert a picture over here so that you can kind of get just a closer look of exactly where the Rook Pearson is located. And the reason why I definitely want to make sure I include a picture is because sometimes the Rook Pearson gets confused with the daith, duff. And believe me, when I first started getting Pearsons, I actually did confuse the two quite often. Not always on, like, it was mostly on accident or just because my thoughts were going a little too fast at the time and like when I was talking about a specific person I'd accidentally say the wrong one. So if you've ever gotten them confused before, you are not alone, don't feel bad. But because of how close in proximity they are to one another, they do sometimes get confused. A lot of the times people will think a rook piercing can cure headaches, whereas it's the daith, the one that's usually connected with. So if you've ever thought that, Again, you're not alone. So again, the Rook Pearson is in that little area. It's kind of, it has like a ledge on the ear. So usually when you get your Pearson, it like has this part that's up top and then it has another one that dangles down below. It's like a little crevice up in there. So now that you know exactly which Pearson we're gonna be talking about in this guide, let's go on to the procedure and pain that you may experience when getting this Pearson. Now, as with any cartilage Pearson, you may experience slightly more pain than say a lip Pearson person or a lobe Pearson. Because cartilage Pearsons do tend to be thick sometimes, especially something like the Rook Pearson, it can be a little bit more painful. Also the placement, it is in a tight space, not as tight as some other Pearsons, but tight enough that maybe it becomes a little uncomfortable while getting it done. For me personally, the Rook was a six out of 10, so 10 being the most painful. And the main reason why is just because it's a tight space. All of my Pearsons that end up being in tight spaces usually end up being more painful just because it's more comfortable because the piercer is trying to like finagle all of this equipment and by all of this equipment I mean two things but also their hands into this tiny space to get it to work right so that's primarily the reason why I rank it so high it itself was not painful to me but keep in mind as always pain levels vary what is painful to you may not be to me and what's painful to me may not be to you so whereas mine may be a six out of ten yours may have been a three out of ten or could be a three out of ten if you haven't gotten it yet it is a thicker piece of cartilage it's kind of similar to the daith which again, can lead to a little bit more pain. It may be a little bit more painful than say just a regular old Helix Pearson, but that is not to say that it's actually going to be that way. So how is the Rook Pearson actually pierced? Much like every other Pearson, your piercer is going to use a hollow needle and usually something to catch it with may not always be that case, but usually they will. Typically when the Rook is being pierced, I would say more often than not, it's gonna be done from the top down instead of the bottom up. I feel like that would be very difficult for someone to get in there and go from the bottom up, but I don't see it not being a possibility. From my experience as well as my research, for the most part, piercers go from the top down when piercing the rook. So they're gonna start off up top and go down. A clamp may be used, maybe, but because of how the rook is shaped, I don't necessarily see a clamp being very useful. As I mentioned in a lot of videos, clamps are used by piercers if they feel comfortable using them. If they'd rather freehand it, they're gonna freehand it. That's what they're comfortable with. They'd rather use a clamp. That's what they're most comfortable with. They're gonna use a clamp. I just don't see a clamp working very well with the rook just because of 
how thick the cartilage is as well as just how it's shaped. That's not to say though that it can't be done. I've just never seen it done that way. But again, if you get a Rook piercing and your piercer uses a clamp, there's nothing wrong with that. Same if they don't use a clamp. And then once the piercer has taken the needle and it's gone through the Rook, they'll feed the jewelry through, usually a curved barbell, and it's gonna be pretty long and we'll get to the jewelry in a minute, but that's to account for swelling. Healing and aftercare. I feel like healing and aftercare for pretty much any cartilage piercing is the same at this point. Some may be a little bit more difficult to heal than others, but across the board, they're pretty much the same. Though I will say that the internet can never seem to come to a general understanding of healing times. And because of that, I just went on the average of what everyone was seeming to say. This piercing can take six to 12 months to heal. I know. That's a pretty wide range in there. You know, you go from half a year to a whole year. That's just the nature of cartilage piercings. They take forever to heal. If you think your cartilage piercing is healed after six weeks, guess what, you're wrong. Again, six to 12 months is pretty standard for any cartilage piercing. Now, this does not mean that you can't change out your jewelry to something shorter during that time, because again, you're gonna be pierced with something longer to account for swelling, and that swelling's gonna go down a whole lot faster than it's gonna take for your piercing to heal. So you can swap it out for a shorter jewelry at that point, but you shouldn't be like swapping it out often until it is completely healed. As is common with any piercing timeline for how long it's gonna take your piercing to heal, well, very person to person. So whereas it may take one person 18 months to completely heal their Brook Pearson, it may only take nine months for someone else. But please know that this is the standard for cartilage piercings. They take a while to heal. They can be a pain. They are very temperamental and anything will irritate them. So aftercare, with a Rook piercing. Pretty much the same as any other cartilage piercing. First of all, always handle a piercing, whether new or old, with clean hands. You don't want to potentially cause an infection, spread an infection. We don't want that, that's not good. That prolongs the healing process. If you are a side sleeper, do everything in your power to not sleep on the side of your new piercing. So when I got my Rook done, it's on my right ear. I slept on my left side. Standard aftercare for a piercing. First thing is saline salt solution. This can either be a pre-made one, such as Neomed or H2Ocean, or it can be one that you've made yourself. Don't overdo the cleaning. I say this all the time, cleaning it more often is not gonna make it heal faster. In fact, it'll prolong the process of healing. Twice a day is what I typically recommend, once in the morning, once in the evening. If you do notice crusties like forming throughout the day, you can do a third time in between those two times, but honestly, two to three times is all you need to do. But you also don't wanna under clean it because then that can also lead to problems and prolong the healing process. If you use a pre-made one, you can do a variety of different ways to clean it. You can spray it directly onto the Pearson site, let it sit there and then rinse it off. Make sure you're rinsing it off because you don't want that salt to stick around because then that can cause irritation. Or you can spray something like a Q-tip or gauze or anything like that and just clean around the area. Again, a lot of people don't like Q-tip usage. I don't mind it just because I know that there is the possibility that little fibers can pull off and get wrapped around the jewelry. You just have to be conscious of it and be very careful when cleaning. So if you create your own saline salt solution, make sure you are using the correct increments. So the first thing, eight ounces of distilled or bottled water. Do not use tap water because there's stuff in tap water that you don't want to put on essentially an open wound. With your eight ounces of distilled or bottled water, you're going to mix one eighth to one fourth of a teaspoon of non-iodized sea salt. Make sure it is non-iodized. Basically, this means it's iodine free. You just mix that up and then you can use that as your solution. It takes a little bit more time, but it's not as costly as the pre-made ones, but the pre-made ones are very easy. You know, you just spray and go. Whereas with the homemade ones, you have to go through the process of making it. Again, don't use tap water and do not go over one fourth of a teaspoon of non-iodized sea salt because too much salt can lead to prolonging the healing process. Just cause you added more salt does not mean it's gonna heal faster. When mixing your own, just put it in a cup of some kind where you could dip a Q-tip or dip a gauze in there. And then that way you can put it on the Pearson site. You could also try to like put your ear in there, but because of where its placement is, it may not work too well. We can always attempt it. You can use a gentle cleanser. It's usually not recommended to use it right away 
only if you're noticing more crusties forming as the healing process goes along, but you can actually use one. There are a variety of different ones you can use. My recommendation is Dr. Bronner's. It's the same type of soap that I use for when I'm healing a tattoo. It's unscented, it's gentle. A lot of tattoo artists and piercers recommend it. That's the one that I always recommend. And never, ever, 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 ever use things like rubbing alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, neosporin, and bactine. Don't ever use those things. First of all, bactine says on their website, don't put us on a piercing. The actual company is saying don't do it, probably shouldn't do it. Alcohol products dry out the skin, which prolongs the healing process. And then things like neosporin do tend to prevent oxygen from getting to the piercing site, and your piercing does need oxygen to heal properly, but if you're clogging that up, it can't heal properly. So just don't use these products. If you've used them in the past and had good luck with them, you got lucky, don't use them again. And then finally, don't mess with your jewelry. This goes for any person. Don't sit there and twirl it, don't twist it, don't mess with it, don't move it in and out and all that kind of stuff. Leave it alone. Even when you clean it, clean it gently so it doesn't move too much. It's okay if it moves while you're cleaning it, but just don't sit there and play with it. Time for the fun part that everyone always gets excited about, jewelry. So we're gonna start with jewelry sizing. What is the typical sizing for a rook piercing? Typically, it is pierced at a 16 gauge as well as pierced with 5 16 of an inch in length for the bar, usually with a curved barbell. This can be downsized. The length of it can be downsized once the swelling has gone down, but more often than not, a lot of people tend to stick at 5 16 of an inch. I believe I was pierced at 5 16 of an inch in length, but honestly, it's been so long now, I don't quite remember. But for the most part, that's what you're gonna be pierced with. You can downsize. The next one will be like, one fourth of an inch. That is kind of short, but you may be able to. More often than not, people are gonna stick at the 5 16 of an inch. And now time for everyone's favorite part. What are your jewelry options for a Rook Pearson? So you actually have quite a few options for the Rook. Again, I've mentioned that most common are the curved barbells. You can also do circular barbells, also known as horseshoes. And then you can also do a variety of different kinds of hoops. So like a segment ring, a CBR, captive bead ring, a seamless, ring. You can even do clickers if it works well. And then as always, retainers. I always talk about how I'm not a fan of hoops, but the Rook Pearson is like the is like one of the few Pearsons where I actually enjoy hoops in them. I think they look really cute. I myself am interested in changing mine to a small hoop. I don't like hoops for the most part, but I do in a Rook Pearson. So you do have quite a few options when it comes to your Rook Pearson as to what you can actually wear in it, which is pretty cool. Makes it a very versatile Pearson. And it is growing in popularity, which is great to see. So they are becoming more and more common. So this is just a quick little rundown guide of the Rook Pearson. Whether you're thinking about getting one or you already have one, maybe this is just some information that you were unaware of. Let me know in the comments below if you have a Rook Pearson and what has your experience been with having one. If you don't have one, but been thinking about it, you know, what's stopping you? Talk about it in the comments below. We love the Rook Pearson. It's a great one. And again, if you would like to vote on the next Pearson comprehensive guide that I I do. I do have a Patreon and that is where the voting takes place. Special thank you to my patrons. You can help support the channel on Patreon while having access to videos early, viewing patron only content and more. But that is it for this video. If you enjoyed it, please give it a big ol' thumbs up. Going down there and hit that subscribe button wherever it may be because I don't know. Even though I do, this is just my shtick now. Also hit that notification bell in case you want to know when I upload and in case YouTube wants to let you know when I upload because I would really appreciate it. And until next time, bye guys.